thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Sam. And also thank you, Yanis and um, uh, Helena. Helena. And also um, our, our lady that helped us a little bit coming around, Alexia. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been really nice and very generous. And uh, I really enjoy learning what other people say about libraries. I've been thinking a lot about libraries uh, or collections, may maybe more so. Um, and it was therefore also very uh, special to kind of get this invitation for this talk, to be part of this event. Uh, but it's also kind of a challenge because I don't think that Sam or Nathan know or realized how much I have been working and thinking through the practice of collecting throughout my life. Um, I have many, many collections that I don't ever talk about because it's a, another part is not necessarily, um, you know, part of my um, art. It's a part of my personal life. And when I present stuff, I usually uh, pretend to be an object, meaning a compression or a block. I'm not pretending to be myself. So now I'm going a little bit deeper into my own kind of uh, background. Um, so it's kind of a challenge to make sense of something that has been in my entire life, but also very on a very unintelligible kind of level. I'm just a collector, a hoarder. Um, so I'm going to kind of spin a thread here um, through a, a framework that is actually the Prelinger Library. This is a library in San Francisco. Um, and uh, I visited it last month and I scanned it. Just wanted to show you also the Wikipedia article uh, where they describe the special parts of the Prelinger Library. Um, it's not a normal type of library. It's not the institutionalized type of library where you kind of sit, you find a book in a catalog and you take it out. When you go to this library, the founders, uh, Rick and Megan Prellinger and their collaborator, Jay, they welcome you, they sit you down, they give you a cup of tea. Uh, actually, what's very nice, uh, uh, in this case, we didn't get a cup of tea, we got a, a bottle of cola, which you can see here, <laughs> flattened out over the table. And then they sit you down and they just explain what it is and it's their life's work, basically. Um, they made a map, which is a kind of a, an associative library map. They call it also, by the way, very interestingly, uh, the library of the future. I feel like there is something going on there where we're trying to rethink what a library could be. Um, and they show it and they tell you and they uh, explain that it's not just about telling a story or reading a story. It's about browsing. It's about associations. Um, so what's special about this library also is that it doesn't just have books. It has digitized books, around 30,000 that are also hosted by the Internet Archive. Uh, it has also objects. It has political pins uh, that they describe as having a cosmos of meanings of a particular time in a very tiny object. It has uh, videotapes. It has a collection of um, license plates, maps of California. Um, it has all kinds of stuff that is not organized by writer, but by associative pathways. And so this map is very nice because the moment when you look at it, I found all the things that like make my brain tick. <laughs> and I got so excited when I was there, but there was not a lot of time. So what I decided to do is to scan the library instead and to just, you know, revisit maybe some of the subjects. So I'm taking you on a tour to this library, but really also, uh, actually they call it the library of serendipity, to kind of serendipitously, or to kind of like, uh, maybe not at all, but like force, brute force myself into the library. Um, here we have the free books. We're just gonna take a little tour. Um, and I'm thinking about like, how to kind of insert my collections into such a library of collections, right? Um, so this is something that I've been thinking about a lot, what it means to collect, like what it means for me to be a, a hoarder in a way. Um, one of the first memories that I have thinking through this is a conversation with John Setrum. John Setrum is uh, an artist from Chicago. We've collaborated uh, quite a lot in the past, especially since 2010 when we started 
organizing what was called the Glitch Festival, gli.tc slash h, um, which is where uh, we met. And in 2010, we already had a conversation about our ways of dealing with digital materials and collecting digital materials. So both him and I are collectors of all objects, like really of all objects. Um, but also of digital objects, meaning mostly glitches, like wild appearing glitches. And we both had scrapbooks of printed out glitches back in the days. So we were talking about how there is a particular type of artist that basically collects, collects, and then threads, and then takes a step back. And then through that step and through those connections, start to analyze and think and create new you know, ways of looking at your maybe digital materials, maybe analog materials. So that's something that I feel is very specific to a particular type of artist. I've seen that a lot of artists that make work that might be informed in a similar way as I make my work, which is research-based, they might also have a lot of other types of collections. So now I'm opening up my collection that I normally don't share and I'm only vaguely um, excited to show, but then also think it's kind of funny. Um, I'm tethering from the Netherlands, so my internet might take a second to uh, give you a PDF of collections. Um, yeah, this is pre-digital, so this is pre, like, this is where it all starts. <laughs> um, my uh, old collection, uh, and I tried to take a step back for this presentation and um, analyze what type of collections these are. Because then you start to notice that there's different ways of thinking through collecting and maybe also as you develop as an artist, as a collector, as a human being. <laughs> the way you look through materials, objects, and things that you can take, you, you start to see that they can be collected in different ways. So my first traditional collection is uh, a collection of stamps, especially the colored ones that are just like sets, finite sets that you can end. You can get them all and you feel accomplished. Um, I think that's like one of the most traditional ways of collecting, maybe not the most interesting ways, and I soon kind of veered away from that, starting to collect non-finite sets, maybe permutating artifacts. So here we have uh, my boxes full of special rocks. Um, I have, uh, back in the days, uh, I wanted to have museas. I had museas. This is a Museum de Nautilus, uh, which is the Dutch name for uh, a shell. Uh, it has also some rules of Grown-up people have to pay six guild, uh, four guilder, children pay two guilders, and you're not allowed to touch. Um, then I had also this like, kind of like obsessive, I don't know what that is, I really like this rabbit. <laughs> and so I have 12 different editions of the same book. Uh, also puzzles and uh, stick puppets, I have much more, but I was ashamed to photograph more of it. I thought, let's keep it funny. Um, there is a collection of sugar bags that was saved for the museum of my best friend from my childhood. Um, but these bags never made it to his collection because his mother found out that he secretly ate the sugar at night because she found the sugar in the bed. So I was not allowed to give the sugar bags anymore. Um, I also have several I would call naive collections. They kind of consist of objects that I just can't seem to throw away. Um, this is a collection of bugs, maybe a pre-iteration of glitches. Um, they are casts of my teeth. Seeds that I found that look nice. Childhood stuffed animals. Now, I'm sure that everybody has some of that, but, you know. Then I really like this one. This is a collection of dog socks, uh, but it's not really my collection. It's of my brother's dog who likes to collect any sock everywhere. Um, then there is collections that kind of function as an abstract or an essence of a space or a place. And they kind of consist out of uh, memory artifacts, I would say, like things that kind of like just specially capture a place. So um, this is my um, box from Australia, which has corals, a ponytail of an actual pony, shells and a part of a clock. I have uh, from the US a dried salamander, four butterfly wings, a bug, some very beautiful notes written by my mom because we're on a road trip together. 
uh, which includes a list of the names of my friends she met, because you know she's older now, she's uh, 80 years old, so she meets all these young people, she wants to remember the names. And then she has a note of how we can be having the best time in the car, so be nice, share and do things together. I loved it when I opened this, I thought, ah, oh. yeah. Uh, Russia is a, a floater, a spring, some old barbed wire. Uh, here we have Mexico, which is a little bow tile, a fridge, amulet, some stones, and some old and new bottle caps. I don't remember from when, maybe it was even when Arion was there. Oh, Peter was there. Um, Japan, a leaf, some strings, three bucks, dried grass, maybe around 100 yen, uh, which is saved in a side view car mirror cover. Objects that are more than just an object. My collection of dried frogs. This used to be a bigger collection, but the dog, some of the collections are still at my parents, and the dog comes and eats the frogs. Uh, and I also have sent some to my friends, so is, this is a you know. um, a collection of wishbones that still have a wish inside of them. Good. So I have this is just a small abstract of collections I have and like different ways to like kind of think through them. Like and, and, uh, taking a step back, seeing how these collections are all a little bit different. So the sum, as I think, is the sum of my objects kind of have become more than just the objects. I think that's also kind of the point of having any type of collection. And we see that a lot this problem that is arising now with uh, the word that has three letters and I shouldn't be saying NFTs. Uh, there's a lot of collecting, but the consideration of what a collection actually is, is like kind of, oop, it's kind of like uh, getting a little bit uh, forgotten maybe. It's about to bring back what is the sum of your collection. Uh, it is impossible to capture what all my objects together represent. They are kind of a conduit for my imagination. So they form a cosmos. It's like kind of the cheesy way to say it, but sometimes cheese is tasty, I don't know, uh, in their own right. Um, and so while making and collecting, uh, 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 th this making of a collection is born out of the desire to kind of, I think, pin something down. But there's also this inherent battle that I'm always fighting because I cannot actually pin the things down that I want to find. So I'm always searching beyond. I'm constantly chasing and reformulating the end or the limit of my collection. Right, so that's like me and my uh, childhood collections. But that's just where it kind of like started. Now, when I think through my own art practice, so now I'm back in the Prelinger library where you know, I put my, uh, my, I finally can get rid of the boxes because I put them here now. Um, I thought through what I've been making recently, which is kind of uh, in the digital, are also kind of like um, collections. So here, um, I think this one is familiar as we just saw it somehow. Uh, this is a vernacular file format. Um, it's a work uh, that I kind of, um, compress the same image and then bring a flaw to the code and then the language of the file format comes up to the surface and you can see the different types of glitches. This is uh, uh, two years ago now, the Stelic Museum bought the work but they didn't buy the work, they bought uh, my collection of 16 gigabytes of broken data and uh, they then asked me if they could also print something so I had to make a print for them. Um, this is a collection called uh, a Lexicon of Glitch Effect and for this, I watched, um, I think it was like uh, 30 uh, of the most uh, highest box office successes of Hollywood movies, basically IMDb, uh, Internet Movie Database indexed movies. I watched them, uh, all the sci-fi movies, so that particular genre, uh, and looked for glitches and then described what, that, what they meant to kind of like create this like a lexicon of how uh, particular disturbances uh, create meaning and change meaning over time. Um, and then finally, so this is just three works, but I thought like um, what you don't see behind the screen is, the, is this artwork <laughs> right there. It's just if we pull up, like I was supposed to ask Sam, but that's a joke. Sam, Sam's sitting in the back. He has a day off. Uh, so we're just going to go in it instead, but that means that we have to load it for a second. I'm well aware that it's 10 minutes and then we have to eat, so I'm going to go real quick. 
I've been working a lot on glitch and disturbance, but I realized that the language of glitch and disturbance is um, sometimes not so easy to bring to other discourses. And so uh, when I won the Collide at CERN award and I got to visit CERN for two months, uh, I also wanted to kind of like look to build bridges between what I've been doing and what scientists, how I could speak with scientists about that. You need to use another language. And so what um, came out of it is a research in resolutions. So I kind of like stepped away from glitch and uh, disturbances to what resolutions are. And to me, a resolution is not just a way to make something function, it's also a way to compromise other ways of working. And we see that already, for instance, in codec uh, analog celluloid where Kodak just made it work to make money, but did never test it on people of color, for instance. So there's a racist compromise because we want to make money. Um, so I started to think in like, how could I collect compromises? What are resolutions and what are compromises? And so every time I spoke to a scientist, which happened like about twice a day for two months, so I had a lot of conversations, I would go to the scientist and I would ask them, a a very specific question that's like right behind this beam. Imagine you could obtain an impossible image of any object or phenomenon that you think is important with no limits on spatial, temporal, energy, signal to noise or cost resolutions. What image would you create? And so what I got was a collection of impossible images. What I really got were different types of compromises. And I, I really think that that's where you start to understand where you can push technologies. If you learn where the compromises are, where you learn what is being um, neglected in the setting of a resolution, then you know where you can also push, for instance, as an artist and get more critical with your materials. So this is the blob. I put like a, a collection of, um, a small collection of uh, answers to my question. I also for the occasion put in like my own um, kind of um, organization or kind of genres of compromise that I've abstracted from all their answers. Um, so there is images that are impossible due to spatial uh, resolutions, images that are impossible due to time resolutions, then there are historically impossible images due to resolutions uh, in knowledge, energy, or cost, but that have become, that can become possible after time. There are images that uh, will become possible, but are just not possible right now. And images such as this one, the pale blue dot, uh, that were once possible, but are no longer possible. Um, then there are images based on speculation, disbelief or imagination. Uh, and finally images or objects that can only be inferred transcoded or otherwise perceived involving a substantial signal to noise bounty. Well, okay, it, this particular talk is not about my categorization, but what it is about is uh, what collecting can give you. It can give you a way to take a step back and start to organize and by organizing, revisiting and re-understanding classifications. And so uh, what this particular work for me did is like give me an access into impossibilities. I'll be working more on that in the future, but um, for this talk, I thought that was maybe the most interesting to add. And um, now I'm very interested in having uh, some dinner. <laughs> Thank you.